America. I'm Hawaiian. I'm Kanaka Maoli, born and raised on the Big Island. And so I understand patriotism uh, to a larger degree because of my upbringing when I was younger. Um, I was in Disneyland, uh, Disneyland, it's changed a lot, but I was in Disneyland in 1976 during the bicentennial when dinosaurs roamed the earth, and it was during that time uh, that uh, there were there were people like Johnny Horizon on trash cans and red, white, and blue all over the place. Um, I saw my very first patriotic pr parade uh, in San Diego, California in the summer of 76. It was in that time of being an eight-year-old uh, eight or a seven-year-old where I was tremendously impressionable in that age that everything uh, that I saw, I began to absorb because of my young brain, and I saw just, although I did not know all the complete history of the United States of America, at least I knew enough for me to say that there was something special about the country that you and I were born in. Uh, not only was the country amazing that we were born in, but also being raised in Hawaii is none, uh, like no other place. I, I know you might come from another city in a small town in Midland America or another urban setting and nothing to take away from where you were born and raised in, but I believe that uh, God blessed me, especially my family and you, if you lived in Hawaii and you are in the United States of America. Um, with that understanding of understanding that grows as you realize, you realize that there are people that really are legends who have given up their life. I think we throw the term legend around so loosely today. Uh, legend, that's a legend. I get it. I call people legend all the time, but not like they should be really, like there are people who really are legends, like the goats, like greatest of all time. We throw that along ar uh, around a lot, but I understand that. Uh, being in Arlington National Cemetery over nine months ago where I took that video, um, I, I knew that we, I was amongst a field of greatness, of people who literally would rush in while people were running away. When I think of greatness, I have to think about this. I, I think about a legend. I think about my dad. My dad was a legend in my eyes. He wasn't a legend in his, his own eyes. My dad was very humble. When my dad graduated from high school, he was a great baseball player. My dad batted left through right. He was ambidextrous. And uh, he was so good that he got recruited from the Big Island. Back in those days, it's not, it's, that's that's, that's not easy to do. He got recruited from the Big Island to play on a statewide team that played in the American Legion. He was on the All-Star team. And on that All-Star team, uh, that's not the photo I want. Um, on the uh, All-Star team, that's the one I want. He ended up in the state championship team and it went to Long Beach, California, where he played on that team that ended up winning. And a scout from the Milwaukee Braves at the time, I know they're Atlanta Braves, but the Milwaukee Braves wanted him to join their team and, as a free agent, but he turned it down because um, he and mom were going to get married, and so he loved conquered, right? Love won. If they did that, I wouldn't be here today. But anyway, moving along. Um, then my dad, did, instead of going baseball, he knew that he had to feed a family, so he became a police officer. My dad was a police officer. Uh, that's dad without the mustache. That, that's dad with a Tom Selleck mustache. Um, <laughs> but back then, my dad was, uh, believe it or not, he was the rookie of the year, and in 13 years, he became policeman of the year twice on the Big Island. Uh, for those of you who are in police force, yeah. He was a Shopo shop steward, a, a shop steward for Shopo, the union for the police officers. Uh, and then in the 13th year of his uh, police career, he realized that there was a ceiling. He saw the ceiling, knew that he would have to make a shift, and he did. And the Hawaiian Holiday Macadamia Nut Company, owned by Paul and Anita Di Domenico, uh, the parent owners were of uh, Ghirardelli Chocolate and Golden Grain Macaroni, made him an offer that he couldn't refuse. Uh, they doubled his pay in the police department and said, we would send your kids to any private school that they want. And you know, I did it, I stayed in Honoka. Oh, come on, how you like that, let's go. <laughs> <clears throat> And we, that's where I stayed. Um, my dad made moves that he needed to make in order to help the family. To me, my dad, as I, as I pass, you know, the older I get, and he just passed away two weeks ago, uh, almost two weeks ago, as I realized my dad was literally, to me, a legend, like a legend. Uh, my dad started the second largest um, security guard firm called Royal Guard Security. At one time, it was the largest and no longer exists. 
Um, they were the guys that brought in the Smokey the Bear hats, you know, those guys. And they were the gray uniforms, and they would work at the Stan Sheriff's, uh, Stan Sheriff, that was their place, and Dole, Dole Pineapple, and Castle and Cook, and my dad and his, and his partner brokered all the deals. They grew to about 200 staff, 200 employees. And then um, during a time of, uh, of reorganization, uh, my dad's partnership got dissolved with his partner. My dad had to go his separate ways. And it was in that time that my dad came with me, and he was distraught at the dissolving of the partnership that he loved and he put so much into it, I took him with me to a men's camp at the old Makaha Resort on the west side, and that's where, at a men's camp, he gave his life to Jesus. <clears throat> Mom and dad picked up stakes, moved to Portland, Oregon, and then from Portland, Oregon to Las Vegas, where Pastor Benny Perez became their pastor, and my parents grew tremendously. I look back, and I honestly can say with a strong conviction that my dad was an absolute legend. You know, the Bible has stories of legends. People, they're not legends, legendary stories. They are stories of men and women used by God that were legends. When you think about the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament goes to the hall of faith of fame in the Old Testament. And as, as a matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, not the eye cloud, but the cloud of witnesses, not the crowd, because the crowd will turn on you. The crowd said to Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Hosanna in the highest one week, and on the next week, that same crowd said, crucify him, crucify him. So don't go with the crowd. you got to run with the cloud. So he says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that entangles us and, and hinders us and the sin that holds us down, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us, and let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. You are in a race right now, and it's a marathon, and it is not a sprint. And you will sprint in the marathon. You might walk through the marathon, but you are still in a race. And God has each and every one of us on that path. Run it with perseverance. The writer of Hebrews, they're not sure who it is. They wonder if it's Paul or it could be Apollos. The, the writer never took credit for the letter to the Hebrews that had been scattered throughout the world at that time. And that writer says in verse 11, he says that there's a hall of faith, hall of fame. And he mentions Abraham and Noah and Enoch, and he goes through a whole list of people. But in verse 7 of chapter 11 of Hebrews, the writer writes, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. Noah built a large boat online, a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that, he had, that had never happened before. And by faith, by his faith, Noah, his faith condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. Noah was important. Noah built an ark. Noah, the ark was so big, it was so detailed in the way that God told him to build it. And um, when you go off to college, they're going to say, well, there's the Epic of Gilgamesh that all of us, you know, and, and I can tell you that the Epic of Gilgamesh is, is, is an interesting story and that has been preserved throughout history. But in the Epic of Gilgamesh, it has nothing to do with the salvation of humanity. In Noah's ark, in the story and the account of Noah, if you ever want to go a deeper dive, go look up Ken Ham Ministries. Some people look to him. I, I, I think he's interesting. Ken Ham Ministries. And go look him up. Ken, like ham, ham and eggs. Ken Ham. And look him up. And it's really interesting because what God begins to do with this people, God begins to sovereignly protect a group of people that he loves. Here's why. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 to 8, the Bible tells us that the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth. The Lord is observing. The Bible tells us that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are for him. Can somebody get me that scripture for the next service? Um, upstairs, thank you. The eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the earth. So the Lord is watching. The Lord is looking. And so what he wants to do is strengthen you, right? He wants to strengthen us. But it says that he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and 
totally evil, consistently and totally evil. Now, you have to remember that was a much smaller population back, base back in those days and compared to what we have today. So we thank God for the righteous, right? I mean, so the righteous are not, you know, holier than thou. It's people who are set apart for God. I, I believe I'm speaking to the right people in the room. I believe that after two years, I've been dropping stuff. I've been saying stuff. If you're watching my Deep Dive Wednesday, I go a little bit deeper on Deep Dive Wednesday. If you are awake, you know, so I slid that one in there. Tonight, I'm not sliding anything. Today, I got to say it straight, just a little bit straighter. Because I'm really, really concerned. I'm concerned. And I know that you are as well. And I might be preaching to the choir, but I think I'm going to help a lot of people. And I might even bring some awareness that you might have never seen it like this before. And it is in this story and in this place, in verse 6, it says, So the Lord was sorry that he had ever made them and put them on the earth, and it broke his heart. How do you break God's heart, Right? And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race off uh, the, uh, I've created on the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, all the people, and even the birds of the sky. And I'm sorry I ever made them, but Noah found favor with, with God. Noah, out of all the human beings on the planet, out of one family, he found a man, from all the human beings, from all the families, he found one man. The eyes of the Lord searched throughout the earth, and he found that man, and he didn't find him to be perfect. He didn't find him to be, to be sinless. What he found him was to be blameless. And, and not only was he blameless, in other words, uh, uh, um, yeah, we, I'm sure that he might have hit his finger while he was hammering, and we might have said, like, oh, gosh, darn it. He might have done that, or I don't, know, I don't know what his language was at the time, but I can tell you that this man was not wicked, that this man was blameless. The Bible also goes on to tell us in verse 9, now Noah was a righteous man, and the only, everybody say only, the only blameless person living on earth at the time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. And now God saw that the earth had become, and God observed all the corruption in the world, for everyone on earth was corrupt. And God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy. Imagine this. He's telling one person out of everybody, I'm going to tell one person. And I can share this with only Noah. I can only share this with Noah. And he says to Noah, I've decided to destroy all living creatures for they have filled the earth with violence. So we've got wickedness, we've got corruption, we've got violence. That's what was happening. And out of the human population that was very limited at that time, there was only one man. He says, yes, I will wipe them all out along the earth. And so... The Bible tells us in Genesis 7, verse 5, so Noah did everything as the Lord commanded him. So Noah did what the Lord commanded him. Noah built an ark. It took 120 years to build it. Noah lived to a very, very old age, like 600, like, like beyond that. Noah was such an old man. I mean, that back in those days, you lived longer. The, the food was cleaner. Come on, you know what I'm saying? The, uh, the atmosphere was a lot healthier. It was different. God would allow men to live longer. I think Methuselah was the oldest man in the Bible in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. I think he lived to about 1,200 years old. I could be wrong. He was a very old man. So when you think about it, God finally says, I'm going to put a limit to man years um, after the Tower of Babel, and you will not live past 120 years. Um, it is in this time that Noah obeys God, so he builds an ark, 120 years to build it. He builds a big boat to the exact specifications that God tells him to. The boat that Noah, Noah was going to build was 450 feet long. Imagine that. That's longer than a football field. That's, that's, that, that's from end zone to end zone and beyond at Aloha Stadium right here in the back. That is massive, massive. It was 75 feet wide. It was 45 feet tall. And Noah and his sons were the only ones that were building it. Can you imagine all of the criticism, everything that was going on during Noah's time? Uh, it could handle waves that were 100 feet high because there probably were going to be waves when God unleashes the water from caverns in the earth and rain that to torrents that pours down. 45 feet tall because 25 and a half, wait, 20 and a half, 22 and a half feet would be at the bottom, and at the bottom of this would be underwater. The other 22 and a half feet would be above the water, and that's because it would have to pass over the highest peaks in the world called Mount Everest, Mauna Kea, and Mauna Loa. 
22 and a half feet had to pass over the highest height. So you had the equal amount of the ark under the water as the equal amount of the ark that is above the water. The lesson for me and for you today is the foundation of your life must be just as deep as it is going to go high. If it goes high and there is nothing below it, you have to have just as much above the ballast line as you have under the ballast line. Otherwise, your life will tip over and you will be in trouble. What we put daily in our ballast stones, in rocks, the ballast stones are the most important things that keep the buoyancy of a boat rather than flipping it over. But I digress, and here Mo Noah does exactly what God tells him to do. It's amazing. But God was doing something and was saying to us in Genesis, but he was also speaking through Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talks about the days of Noah or the generation of Noah on the screen. And here it is. And it says, however, no one knows the day or the hour. Jesus' own words. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, which is the sunny, sudden rapture of the church. Not even the angels in heaven or the son himself. Jesus said, even I don't know. There's some things God doesn't tell me, and this is one thing that he won't tell me. And this is what he says, only the Father knows. And when the Son of Man, Jesus' favorite term for himself, meaning fully God yet fully man at the same time, he says this. He says, when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it in, as it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat and people didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. And that is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. They didn't know. They weren't ready. But they were warned. But think about this for a moment. Are we any better than Noah's generation? I sure hope so. I mean, we certainly have more believers in Jesus Christ. We've we certainly been covered by the blood. We certainly follow our Lord and Savior. I'm, I, I believe that a lot of people, most, all, most of the people in this room, all of the people in this room today understand what is right and what is wrong. Know that the Bible tells us to not move the ancient boundary lines. It wasn't just talking about your property. He was talking about old ways. You stick to the old ways. Don't get progressive. Don't, don't get off track. This is the things that kind of become the downfall of a nation. A downfall of a nation. Every nation is given about 250 years throughout history. Cal Thomas, syndicated columnist, wrote a book about different generations and different uh, empires says that a, 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 an empire has 250 years of its greatest power and right about the 240th year they start to lose everything because the moral fabric of society begins to pull apart and it gets frayed and then that country or that, that kingdom like the Persian kingdom or the Babylonian kingdom or the Egypt, Egyptian kingdom or the Greeks or the Romans they lasted a long time, longer than America but their zenith was 250 years. And so in this time, I ask the question, are we better off than Noah's generation or are we worse off than Noah's generation? And in Noah's generation, there was wickedness, there was corruption, there was evil in the thoughts and in the intentions. And if I were looking to today, and these are just things taken from the headlines. These are not things that I go looking for. They find you, they'll find you if you want them to. And here it is. We have recent events in Texas of the shooting of children. We have Buffalo, New York. We have a church where a, a, a guy went in and was upset because of politics and, uh, between Taiwan and, and China and opens up on people. We have human trafficking that has been going on for a long time, a long time. And it's not just America. I mean, it's going through America. It's coming, uh, it, it, it's happening. There are deaths of unborn infants, and that debate is going to be massive for a very long time. Um, who gets to determine when a fetus comes to life? Who gets to determine that, us, doctors, or God? Um, we, we have blood not only spilled in Arlington Cemetery, we have blood spilled all over the place. When you, are, are we better off than Noah's generation? When we think about what Disney is doing, Disney um, trying to separate and start to indoctrinate, and um, when you think about the current administration, don't get mad at me, I'm just saying the facts. <laughs> now, that the, that, the, that the current administration is going to pay for sex change therapy and surgery for children. Children, not adults, children. Why does my kindergartner grandson need to learn that? Why? That's my job, not your job. Stay out of my family. Stay out of my family. 
So they're creating the confusion. Are we better than Noah's generation or are we just like it or are we worse? But God found Noah. God found Noah faithful and blameless. And God can find you even though you may not feel faithful, you may not feel blameless, you may not feel righteous. It does not matter how you feel, it's where do you stand with God? When you stand as a son and a daughter, you are righteous. When you come to the cross with, with brokenness and, and, and sincerity of heart, God is not willing that anyone would perish, but all would come to repentance. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. That's why he's been waiting and patient, the Bible tells us in Peter. It's not his long finger said, you naughty, you did that 20 years ago, and you gave, I, I'm, I'm guilty of sin 30 years ago, 34 years ago, that I, I'm not going to even mention, I can tell you that. But it's at the foot of the cross that we stand because of our brokenness. Then we get righteousness. It's not my own. Our own, your own, my own is filthy rags, it says. And, it, and it's a worse term in the, in the Greek than just filthy rags. All of that is the goodness of God. And, 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 and what God was doing was a mercy move on the planet. What seemed like judgment and was judgment. But there are two sides to every sword. There's a judgment side and the mercy side. You get hit with both, judgment and mercy at the same time. When I look at this in Genesis 7, it says in verse 1, when everything was ready, the Lord said to Noah, because of what was going on the earth, get into the boat with all your family for I'm among all the people of the earth, and I can see that you are righteous. And the Bible tells us it rained for 40 days and for 40 nights nonstop. The caverns of the earth were opened up. I'm just giving you a different perspective to look at. It's a biblical perspective, not Mike Kai's opinions. And the caverns opened up and the waters filled and flooded for 40 days and for 40 nights. You know what? I always thought just 40 days, 40 nights, and then they got out. Uh-uh. He was not done yet. There were torrential rains. There were 100-foot waves. The earth was covered in water for 150 days. And then in Genesis chapter 8, so Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives left the boat. And all of the large and small animals and the birds came out of the boat pair by pair. And then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and there he sacrificed as burnt offerings because he was so grateful that they got out. And the animals and the birds that had been approved for that purpose. And then in verse, chapter 9, verse 12, then God said, I am giving you a sign of my covenant with you and with all the living creatures for all generations to come. I've placed my rainbow in the clouds. My rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. And I will remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures. Never again will the floodwaters destroy all life. Never again floodwaters. But I said nothing about fire, but never again. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? This is the truth. I think it was Peter that says the first flood was like the baptism waters cleansing, brand new. The second baptism is the baptism of fire. When you come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you haven't been baptized, get water baptized. We did that yesterday. The young adults did that yesterday at the beach. Was it yesterday? Yeah. They got baptized. They get immersed in water. It's a picture of the grave and you come up. The first baptism is water baptism. But Jesus said, because John the Baptist said, he comes to, bap I come to baptize with water, but he comes to baptize with fire. And the fire is the second baptism that the world will go through. The first one was water, the second one is fire. It's all done for cleansing, it's all done. And so the generation that we belong to, if God is not willing that anyone would perish. And if we stand for righteousness and we get right with God, get right with God, we start thinking right, God will, do, I believe God will move on our behalf. Now watch this. Then it says, it is a sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth and I will never again, I said this with you, with all the living creatures, never again with the floodwaters will I destroy the earth. What God was doing was giving him a rainbow. A rainbow. We see rainbows all the time in Hawaii. Rainbow Falls, you know, in, on the Big Island. We name falls after rainbows. The actual word in the Hebrew is not necessarily rainbow, but it's a bow. And the rainbow is shaped like a bow. A bow and arrow. That's what it's shaped like. It's actually meant to be a, a war, 
um, a war tool. Uh, it's a bow, but there's no arrow sticking up, but that's the bow. Um, the bow, the arrow, actually the rainbow is actually God's symbol to you and I that this is the covenant. There's a suzerain and a an vassal covenant that God makes. So in the ancient world, in, in Mesopotamia, in Israel during that days, you would have a suzerain and you would have a vassal. A suzerain is a very powerful person that makes a deal and a covenant with someone who's a vassal, who is lesser than, and the covenant is mentioned by giving uh, or exchanging something like a receipt. It would be like a slipper or a sandal. It would be a ring or piece of jewelry. And what it says to the vassal, the suzerain says, if you break this covenant and you do not show the sign of the covenant, whether it's the receipt, whether it's the sandal, whether it's the jewelry, whatever it is, I can come and take back everything that you have. That's the way the ancient world worked back then. However, God is saying, I am the suzerain and I am making the deal with you. That I, whenever you see that rainbow, it is me showing you mercy and love and grace. This is my covenant with you. The rainbow doesn't belong to a people group, doesn't belong to an organization for marketing. The rainbow is God's sign to me and to you of his love. That's why when you see the rainbow, you go, oh, look, the rainbow is so pretty. It's more than pretty. Yeah. To some people, it's a prism of water droplets being shot through with sunlight that bring out primary colors. I learned that in the seventh grade. And to some people, it's just beautiful, it's amazing, it's what Hawaii is. But can I tell you, when I look at that, it's more than that. It is God's symbol and it is God's sign of God's goodness and of God's grace. And if you see a double rainbow, that's unique to you. And it's got God saying, you better get your life right when you see a double rainbow. I'm just kidding. God is saying that you are doubly blessed, that I love you more than you could ever imagine. That's what that rainbow means, people. As the worship team comes up, and as we land this plane, I just want to tell you this. I, when you think about how long Noah waited for the rainbow, when, how long he waited for the symbol, the symbol that God was giving him. Let's, let's, look at, let, let, let's list this. It took 120 years to build the ark. 120 years. Because it took at least 100 years to build the wood, the wood to grow. The specific wood that God wanted Noah to use. There is a replica of that somewhere in the Midwest. I forget what state. I'd love to see it. Could be, could, could be cute. Could, be, could get old after a while. But I don't know if it's beautiful. 120 years. Picture? Never mind. Moving right along. Here we go. Then, never mind. Don't forget. Then it took seven days that they waited in the ark with the animals and the family. Seven days. Come on. Like seven days. Where's the water? Yeah. Let's go. 150 days it rained. And waters poured from the earth for 150 days. It took another 150 days for the waters to recede. Can you imagine what quarantine was like for them? 70 days the world dried out and Noah didn't rush it. So when you add all of this, it was 121 years and 12 days for God to finally show him the symbol of the covenant that we know as the rainbow. That was the promise. How many times we try to rush God? God, you're too slow. And God says, hey, be patient. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Wait. I'm very, I, I can be impatient. I'm not very impatient. I can be impatient at times. I must confess. But when we wait on the Lord, when there's something about pausing that God does a work in us. I wanted to talk to you about this. I, I didn't read this up, read this, and I want to read it now, but when you look at this, and go back to chapter 8, verse 6. And Darren, when you come over here, and then get the microphones ready, because you guys might start, start singing real quick. No, never mind, you got nothing not to sing. No more time. Here it is. Um, <laughs> I took the time in the beginning. Here it is. Hello. Anyway. After 40 days, Noah opened, another 40 days, Noah opened the window he made in the boat and released a raven. You know what a raven is, right? They're not from Baltimore. I mean, they're like ravens, like, that's a, that's a great quarterback over there. Man, that guy's, a, that guy's unreal. Anyway, um, a raven is a bird that basically you'll find in the Bible that fed Elijah 
when there was a famine in the land, and it's a dirty bird in terms of uh, you can't eat that bird. You won't eat the bird, and anything that bird touches will make you ceremonially unclean. The raven feeds off of the flesh of other animals or other humans when it's dead. Ravens, will they're like crows or they're like vultures. He sends out a raven, and the raven goes out. The ark to a lot of biblical scholars, and I agree with them too, is that the ark is a picture of the church. It's a metaphor for the church. The ark was real, but it's a metaphor for the church. And Noah is a type of Christ. In the biblical Old Testament theology, a type is a foreshadowing of a Christ. So he's a type of Christ. Melchizedek in the book of Genesis that offers wine to Abraham is a type of Christ. Noah is a type of Christ. The ark is a type of church. And so he lets out the raven, and the Bible tells us the raven goes back and forth, back and forth, and it doesn't come back. It flew back and forth. It says, he also released the dove to see if the water had receded, and he could not find dry ground. But the dove could find no place to land because the water was still covered with the ground, over the ground. So it returned to the boat, and Noah held out his hand and drew the dove back inside. My friend, Pastor Howe, explained this to me, that he said that the raven can be like the Christian that is going out into the world and feasting on the flesh or living out in the flesh and coming back to the church and coming back to the ark and releases, can't find a place to land, can't find a place to land and feeds on the flesh. But he says the Christian that is like a dove is a dove that begins to look and lands where it needs to and brings back to the hand, Noah's hand, to the hand of God. They don't come necessarily to a church, and the church is important. They do come to the church, but the, Jesus is in the church. They come, to, they come to Christ. My bottom line for all of us is this, is that we would be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Wise, uh, it's interesting, a wise as a serpent, but innocent as a dove. And when we are that, when we are awake, we are aware, and we understand what the world is trying to do to, to take us down a different path than we know that we should be going. I think what God does is he, he just needs more people aware. And he needs more people praying. And he needs more people standing. And he needs more people voting. Now, I'm going to say one thing because I don't like to pray what I said. I made the mistake of praying what I wanted to say. So I'm going to say what I say and pray what I pray. Um, I'm not getting involved in politics, but I have been asked to run twice. And it was the highest office in the state, twice. So I'm not going to run for that office because I don't feel called to do it. But I will not stand back and say, we gotta, we're not going to do anything about this. So here's what we're going to do. Here's what we need to do. If you're 18 and above, you should be registered to vote. I'm not going to tell you how to vote. This, I'm, I'm going to tell you how to vote. Vote whatever's biblical. That's it. The, uh, I'm not going to tell you what party. I'm going to tell you what Bible. The Bible. That's how you have to vote. It's the only thing that's going to change the state. Of course, we need a revival. We need God to pour out his presence. We need people to come to Jesus. We need people in the Honolulu Hale to come to Jesus. We need, we need us to live up our, our lives in Jesus. We need to walk that out, not weird, but authentic. We need to walk that out. There's a lot that God needs to do in us. God needs, God needs to do in me. But here's what we're going to do. We are going to be a church that makes an impact for the betterment of Christ. Nothing else but the betterment of Christ and everything else works in Jesus' name. I will unpack this a lot better at Deep Dive Wednesday online where I could probably write my thoughts better and say it more clearer than I did just in the last two minutes. But let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we need you in America. We need you in the state. We need you in this country more than ever before. Our families need you. Husbands and wives need you. Children need you. I need you. We all need a touch from God. And thank you, Lord, that we're going to build our house on you. I, don't, I, want, I want to build my house on you. I don't want to build my house on anything else. My hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. Father, we thank you that as you show us the legend Noah, the one man that you changed, that you used, that changed humanity, it means we're all related. 
we all related because we all come from Noah. We give you all the praise and glory in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Would you keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed just for one more minute? If you've never given your life to Jesus, he loves you so much. The Bible says that God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. That's why he loved the world so much. And he wants you in his family. You know, you don't have to be good enough. You know that? You don't have to earn this. Because if it was good enough and earned, I wouldn't even be there at the age of 21. But it's because of what he did on the cross that I can come. Because of the price that he paid that I could have salvation. Then if that's what it is that I come to him, and you know what, no matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you've been and it doesn't matter what you've done. If you want to start your journey with Jesus right now, and he's not calling the righteous. I'm telling you right now, he ain't calling the righteous. He's Because he, none of us would come. Because we're not righteous before we come to him. We get righteous after. And, 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 and we get sanctified daily and we get set apart. And it's not, all it is is about this. Just, just think about this. Just you and Jesus. Are you ready? And when you surrender your life to him, he changes you from the inside out. Your circumstance may not change drastically, but it will. But he wants to change you first. And he wanted to change me first. I was angry, violent, purposeless, hopeless. There was little under the surface, but there was a lot above it. And when he came into my life and he changed me, and man, I tell you what, it, I, my, my heart changed instantly, but my life took a long time long time I still did some damage after that I was that raven going back and forth before I became like the dove right and so God is not looking for the pre-qualified God is not looking for the already walking right he's not looking for the people Are you close come you close no he's looking for anybody that is saying I know I know in my heart I know and I need you, Jesus, and I want you. And when he comes into your life, he'll forgive you of all of your sins. You get a clean slate, a fresh start, a new beginning. But he gives you your, his, the spirit of God in you, and your life will never be the same. But then comes the hard part, right? Because then you got to walk that out on a journey with God. And we'll walk it with you. We want to. We want to be your church. We want, I'm going to say some truth, truth stuff. And some of it, for some of you, might hurt sometimes. But it's never meant to harm. It's only meant to help. So let's get ready. If that's you at the count of three, would you raise your hand? Online, enter into that chat right here in this room. Get ready. On the count of three, real simply, just raise it. Don't wait for it. Don't wait for it. Just raise it. And we'll all pray together. One, two, three. Put your hands up. If that's you. Hands up all over the place. Put your hand up. Anybody here today? Says, yes, that's what I want. Amen. I got one right there. God bless you. Two right here. Amen. Anybody else? Three. Hallelujah. Three. Anybody else? Four. God bless you. Five right here. Amen. And amen. 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 Six right there. Oh, I see that hand. Amen. And seven on the top. Come on. Awesome. Praise God. And eight right here. Come on. Anybody else? Anybody else? Got nine right there. A young girl. And ten right here in the front. Anybody else? 11 right there. God bless you. I see that hand. I see that hand. 12 right here and 13 right there. I see those hands right there to my far left. Anybody else? Did I miss a hand? Right here. 14 right here. A couple more moments. Five more seconds. Anybody else? There's still time. There's still time. God loves you. See, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's what Jesus said. I came into the world to save the world. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Last hand. Last one. One, two, three. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, great. All right, I want everybody to repeat after me. Say, Jesus, today I surrender. I give you my life. Thank you for loving me before I first loved you. And thank you for the new life you gave me. The old is past. The new has begun. I'm a new creation in Christ, created to serve you to love you, to bring you glory. I'm born again. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to heaven one day, but while I'm here, be my strength for today, hope for tomorrow, my daily bread every day. So mold me, shape me, heal me, use me, lead me, feed me, 
guide me, strengthen me. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen.